We are finally here. The big kahuna, the game people have been asking me to do ever since I dropped a video on Sonic Mania. Sonic the Hedgehog 3. And... Knuckles. <sighs> Can I mini-tangent real quick? I hate referring to this as Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Just what kind of title is that? Too long, cumbersome, awkward. Throughout the video, I'm just gonna refer to this complete package as Sonic 3, and I hope you're okay with that. They're one game anyway, might as well call it as such. Right, so how's the Taxman and Stealth port? I imagine good? Yeah, well, the proof of concept looks good. What's even more baffling to me than Sega restricting the ports to mobile devices is their silence on a Sonic 3 port. There is a proof of concept by the very people who made the ports in the first place. It is completely doable. Alas, we don't have a port, so the next best thing is Sonic 3 Complete. I don't normally discuss ROM hacks, however, this particular hack is so popular that I'd be remiss to gloss over it. If you want an excruciatingly in-depth look at all the options and easter eggs on offer, have a gander at Cybershell's video. He is the resident Sonic lore master after all. What would we do without him? I'll try to keep this brief. Sonic 3's original release had slightly altered level design, a few different tracks, the big arm boss fight, and it was slightly more difficult. When you connected the Sonic & Knuckles cartridge to the Sonic 3 cartridge with lock-on technology, it became what we know now as Sonic 3 and Knuckles. It was slightly easier, removed Big Arm, replaced the boss and power-up music with the music in Sonic & Knuckles, and most important of all, it became one game. Sonic 3 Complete allows you to play either game separately, and you can even tweak the settings to play the older version of Sonic 3 with different music in the Big Arm boss fight. You can choose to put Flying Battery after Carnival Night, where it was supposed to go originally. They even gave Flying Battery a night texture, so the transition from Carnival Night to Flying Battery wouldn't be too jarring. These are the important bits. Needless to say, Sonic 3 Complete is the ideal way to play Sonic 3, but it's just not the same. It doesn't add widescreen or fix the frame rate, two of the biggest fixes that kept me coming back to the ports above all else. I love the options available for Sonic 3 Complete, but I've only ever changed Flying Battery, kept Sonic 3 to the original release to fight Big Arm, and I can activate and deactivate Super Sonic with a button other than Jump, which is a really neat improvement. That said, I do still consider this the definitive version of Sonic 3, so we may as well use this as the basis of my critique. As I said, I only tweaked a few things, so we should all be around the same page. Alright, it's time for the Sonic game everyone loves and no one ever shuts up about. Sonic the Hedgehog 3. It isn't as elaborate as Sonic CD, but we do still open on a cinematic of sorts. Sonic and Tails fly to Angel Island to investigate. A red dude punches Sonic out of his super form, steals the Chaos Emeralds, and runs away. Despite it all happening in-engine without a flashy animation, this is a brilliant setup. The red dude hit you and stole all your gems. Go catch him. That red dude is Knuckles the Echidna, who plays the Troublemaker. You'll constantly encounter him, and he'll make your life miserable, until it's revealed at the end that he was played by Eggman the entire time, and then he helps you out. Simple, but effective. Though, his introduction isn't just for show. This is the first time in the classic series where playing as another character has an impact that isn't exclusively cosmetic. I didn't go into depth with the other characters in my previous videos because I was waiting for the game where they were fully utilized. In Sonic 2, you could play as Tails, but he was just a carbon copy of Sonic. Yet, in Sonic 3, Tails can fly, which differentiates him from Sonic in a huge way. Knuckles can glide and climb up walls at the cost of his lower jump height. Sonic gains a new ability in the form of the Insta-Shield, which lets him completely bypass the spikes on spike enemies, and can be used to hit enemies or bosses a couple frames earlier than you're supposed to. It sounds like a minor upgrade, but it makes boss fights in particular much easier when you learn the ins and outs. It's also a crucial ability to make playing as Sonic viable, when Tails can do the exact same things as Sonic with the ability to fly. Why would you pick Sonic over Tails? Well, he has that rad Insta-Shield. Why would you pick Tails over Sonic? Well, Tails has an easier campaign thanks to his flight, plus he can find secrets much easier. Why pick Knuckles over Sonic? His campaign is harder, with tweaked boss fights and exclusive level pathways that take advantage of his unique abilities. Angel Island is a great way to introduce this concept. Tails can fly up this column of spikes, and Knuckles can break through this stone wall thanks to his spiked Knuckles. While Tails goes along with Sonic in his adventure and ultimately syncs up with him at some point, Knuckles has his own pathway in almost every zone. 
This means that a second playthrough as Knuckles, while familiar, has a different story setup with the Egg Robo and entirely new level design. The best part is that each character, besides Knuckles' nerfed jump height, control the exact same as Sonic. You never need to worry that picking Knuckles will alter how you play. No matter what, it will always be a Sonic game. It also doesn't adversely affect the level design, because the contained sections don't take away from any other path. It doesn't feel like you're missing something huge by picking Sonic, because there's still a sizable chunk of brilliant level to explore. This zone in particular is a great starting point, focusing on the three tenets of Sonic as you would expect it to. Speed here, platforming there, exploration everywhere. In just this first section, there's a bumper on top of a tree that takes you to speed shoes and two different pathways, one with more to collect, another that's more straightforward. If you fail to stay on the top path, which is heavy with platforming, you fall to the bottom path and are forced through an easier section, though you miss out on potential elemental shields or lives. The elemental shields are fantastic for promoting exploration, much more than any other Sonic game. The fire shield gives you a dash in the air with immunity to fire, the lightning shield gives you an extra jump with ring attraction and immunity to electrical hazards, and the bubble shield lets you bounce on the ground for extra height, as well as breathe underwater. The coolest part, though, is that they all act like any other shield. Sonic always gets an extra hit no matter what, you just lose the extra abilities along with it. My chief problem with Sonic CD's level design was its focus on exploration where it didn't matter. Sonic 1 and 2 didn't exactly give the best incentive to explore, especially in the mobile port where you had unlimited continues, but it at least focused less on exploration overall to compensate. It was still fun to explore in those games for speed shoes, invincibility, rings, because it wasn't a focus, and it only happened in spurts. Sonic 3 found the perfect blend, and I posit this is why people like it so damn much. Think about it like this. Angel Island has a metric ton of secret areas, with a tight focus on a few different pathways to the end. You can keep a cohesive and memorable structure like this, while still promoting all three pillars of the triad to equal extents. Run through loops and inside tree trunks, platform on disappearing blocks or zip lines, explore caves and high to reach areas for goodies. To a greater or lesser extent, each zone following this one is the same structure, which is a slight departure even from Sonic 2. That game had different types of zone layouts for different situations. Casino Knight for Sonic's physics, Chemical Plant for his speed and momentum, Aquatic Ruin for pathway selection and punishment. It was less about finding a cohesive structure for the levels to follow, and more about zone identity. Which is probably why Metropolis is the way it is. Sonic 3, on the other hand, discards a bit of that gameplay identity for a solid structure, and I definitely prefer that approach. Though it does homogenize the feel of each zone, it's ultimately for the best. Besides, the unique set pieces and visual themes are what differentiate each zone the most. Hydrocity is much larger than Angel Island Zone, with much more to do and find, yet it never devolves into a maze-like Sonic CD experience. What it does is build a gigantic map with one straight path to an endpoint, and litter multiple pathways along that key path. Hydrocity is allowed to be as large as it is because you're on a straight path the entire time, which is very similar to Chemical Plant. While it doesn't necessarily allow you to avoid water, the water segments come in short bursts and contain the same speed and platforming segments with minimal annoyances. Again, it's all uphill from Labyrinth. I particularly enjoy the focus on the fans to push Sonic through the water, as it both allows for a visually interesting set piece, simultaneously allowing for unique platforming opportunities. Although water isn't entirely avoidable, it's still used as a punishment since there's almost always a better path you can maintain on the top if you're skilled enough. This zone is better than Angel Island in every way. Groovy music, huge and secret heavy, while still focusing on speed and momentum. This huge level is emulated in Marble Garden, Launch Base, Sandopolis Act 1, but other zones are more inspired by Angel Island's relative simplicity, like Ice Cap, Flying Battery, and Sandopolis Act 2, neither of which are inherently good or bad. As much as I like the Hydrosity type level design, it falls flat on its face in zones like Marble Garden. I hate Marble Garden. This zone is where I almost always lose interest in a new playthrough. Again, it has a setup similar to Hydrocity. Huge, multi-layered, secret heavy. My problem with the zone is just how huge it is, the reliance on instant kill spike crushers, John Cena you can't see me wrecking balls, long annoying slopes, and the spinning top. It hits all the right layout beats while screwing up almost everything else. In one of the first rooms, you'll run to the right and instantly fly into a huge ball of spikes that I would be surprised if anyone saw coming their first time. This same spike ball is littered throughout the stage, and it's always at the end of a blitz of speed where you'd never expect it. 
Similarly, there are crushers you need to avoid that can catch you off guard from time to time, though I'll admit they're easy to avoid once you get the hang of them, and at least they open and close quite quickly, in stark contrast to similar crush blocks in Sandopolis. I appreciate a focus on slopes, and some of the platforming is interesting surrounding that concept, but I find it to more often be an annoyance than an interesting challenge. Most of the time you bypass slopes by spinning into blue wheels anyway, so it's hard to defend the use of them in so many instances. I really hate the feeling that I just got punked from a secret area because I can't get back up the slope. Granted, a lot of these levels similarly lock you out of content if you go too far, but it's usually pretty obvious when that's about to happen, like when you go on the water tubes in Hydrocity or something. In Marble Garden, the moment you even accidentally fall onto a slope, you're never getting back up. In Hydrocity, you're committed to moving on. In Marble Garden, it's more so a slap in the face. You'll occasionally find a spinning top that really adds almost nothing to the level other than it lets you float and go really fast on the ground. That floating part is what really bothers me, since it's so incredibly slow until it touches the ground, where sometimes you'll whiz by so fast you'll run straight into a spike ball or other hazard. It's happened to me too many times to count in previous playthroughs, hence why I jump off the spinning top as soon as it looks like I won't need it. Keywords, looks like. There are some pillars you can't break through with a normal spin dash, so you'll need to carry the spinning top with you to break through it and enter a unique set piece that, while cool looking, could just as easily been accomplished without needing to drag this gimmicky spin top with you into potentially dangerous areas. This spinning top is only the tip of the iceberg. There are so many other gimmicks in Sonic 3 that reek of feature creep. The barrels in Carnival Night, the seesaws in Mushroom Hill, the rappel lines in Sandopolis, the light bridges in Death Egg, they don't fit Sonic's speed or platforming well at all. There's no sense of purpose to any of these gimmicks, other than to break up the pace of a level or look flashy. I get that it's kinda cool to rappel down a tower or travel across a light bridge, but they destroy the pace of both Sandopolis and Death Egg. Granted, you can avoid most of these gimmicks depending on which path you take, though the moment you get stuck in either of these speed traps, you can't get out until you're finished with the set piece. At least I understand the inclusion of these two, I can't even fathom why you'd put the spinning barrels or the seesaws in any Sonic game for any reason. Everyone knows how infamously weird the spinning barrels were for kids, and the seesaw don't even get me started. This is variety for no one's sake. In both cases, you press up and down in various rhythms until you're done, and then you're back to speeding around the level, or running into bumpers and balloons and water and gravity and- <coughs> It's not like they all suck, either. I love the spinning cups and launch base, the hand spinners and hydrocity, the spinning poles and flying battery. They promote speed, while also effectively breaking up the pace of a level, without completely halting it. Speaking of halting the pace, Carnival Night! Casino Night wasn't revolutionary, but it did focus on movement in a way I hadn't quite seen before, even in Spring Yard. Pinball bumpers and flippers could launch you to higher platforms, halfpipes were used with the bumpers as obstacles to progression, and while I wasn't a huge fan of the moving blocks or elevators, it was a fine zone with a unique identity. Carnival Night? Eh, I wouldn't call it bad. It has a similar feel to a zone like Hydrocity or Marble Garden, but I don't like how the level obstacles are utilized. The ball bumpers are placed in tight passageways to bar entry, the oyster clam things have springs on their backs, the triangle bumpers lock you into areas, this weird platform thing adds almost nothing to the level, the slopes can be a little too elaborate and don't mix well with Sonic's physics to the point where there's a well-known glitch here to clip out of bounds, there's a random water segment, I already voiced my complaints with the barrel. Now, none of this stuff is outright bad, it's just the combination that always gets to me. I like the extra height you can gain using the balloons. I like the spinning cylinders, used both in speedy sections and more platforming focus sections. Even the music is good, it's just... not... Ideal. A level that focuses on halting Sonic's momentum is interesting as a punishment in a specific pathway, not as an entire zone, that has a lot more linear segments than you'd expect. The best way to describe it is cramped. Taken to the max in Sandopolis Act 2. The first act of Sandopolis is okay. It suffers from a few of the problems in Marble Garden, namely even slower crush blocks, some weird grapple hook zipline jumping between towers. However, generally it's a fun act. I particularly like when Sonic does two laps over one loop. Don't know why, it just amuses me. I don't have a big problem with Act 1. I have a big problem with Act 2. 
Not only is Act 2 quite possibly the longest act in the game, it's incredibly linear, momentarily confusing, and there are ghosts who chase you around the cramped, slow platforming. This looping section with the moving sand can be quite confusing, and the only reason I know what I'm doing now is because I played the game a whole bunch. Even then, on repeat playthroughs, I still get stuck for a little while trying to figure out how to exit the loop. This is in direct opposition to a similar loop in Ice Cap, which is a much faster loop and far easier to figure out. It also acted as a bit of a punishment for failing to platform correctly, as if you fall down, it begins the loop again and you're forced to repeat the platforming challenge. It's much more straightforward, usually just requiring you to push or jump on an ice block to ram through an obstacle in your way. Ice Cap in general feels like what Sandopolis could have been. It starts off with the iconic snowboard segment, but you really start the level inside the ice cave. This section is quite linear, but compensates with some tricky platforming and a few hidden secrets. This works because after a minute or two, you emerge from the cave where the level opens up substantially with some new trampoline gimmicks to play around with. The next act will play with the concept even further, mixing the cave segments and open air organically. Sandopolis Act 2 could have benefited from more expansive level design or more punishing platforming. Neither Ice Cap nor Sandopolis Act 2 have bottomless pits, but as I've mentioned, Ice Cap has its own way of punishing the player, whereas Sandopolis Act 2 only has that one looping segment. After that, death is probably going to be hashed out via crush blocks or rising sand, neither of which I would consider to be incredibly fair or interesting. Ice Cap doesn't really have instant death, though I guess you could argue since Sandopolis Act 2 takes place near the very end of the game, more difficult sections are warranted. However, I would argue you can introduce this element of challenge without instant death, as I outlined in my previous videos. I could see an interesting punishment in the rising sand slowing your movement speed, making the level more about outrunning the quicksand to keep your speed and momentum, rather than avoiding the death planes. I don't think I would even mind Sandopolis Act 2 if it wasn't so consistently lengthy. I usually don't have a problem with longer zones. Sonic Mania has some lengthy endgame acts, and I don't really mind because the moment-to-moment -moment platforming is paced so well. It feels like Sandopolis Act 2 repeats a lot of set pieces, almost none of which are very interesting. I mean, who asked for time management in a Sonic game? Flying Battery has fleeting success with these various ideas. It's a more linear stage with more deadly hazards. There are platforming segments on the bottom that flirt with bottomless pits, but I always found these to be contextually sound. There's always enough lead time to the bottomless pit segments, and the platforming is consistently challenging. I wouldn't go as far as to say it's the most competent or interesting 2D platforming ever, but it's at least not frustrating outside of one issue with the spinning cylinders. Since you need to enter these from the openings on either side, it can feel a little janky sometimes. Either you miss the entrance and fall through, or attempt to enter from the top and fail spectacularly. You'd be surprised how many times I forget that I can't just enter from the top of these things, especially after Sonic Mania allows you to enter from anywhere. Death Egg actually presents a better alternative with these objects, only allowing you to enter from the opening. In both Flying Battery and Death Egg, I do enjoy the advantages of both the fire and electric shields. The fire shield can completely negate the damage from the flamethrower obstacles, as well as bypass lava and lava reef, whereas the electric shield can prevent damage while you run on the electrically charged terrain in Death Egg. Both Hydrocity and Carnival Knight use the Bubble Shield to let you breathe underwater, as mentioned before, and because so many of the zones have a great use for shields, you're always going to want to explore, especially now that Supersonic is back. Now you have incentive to seek the 7 Chaos Emeralds, as well as incentive to seek the 7 Super Emeralds. It works so incredibly well in Sonic 3 because they finally nailed special stage entrances. It is absolutely perfect in every way. Seriously, I can't even think of a sufficient reason to dislike how they're handled, other than not being able to get Supersonic in the first zone. But seeing as you can potentially get them as soon as Hydrocity, you won't see me complaining. This time, you don't need anything to enter a special stage. The real trick is finding where the special rings are hidden. There are about six or seven in each zone, meaning there's ample opportunity to collect all of the Chaos Emeralds. You'd think after you collected the Emeralds, there'd be no reason to go after the special rings anymore, but that's where you're wrong. Anytime you enter a special ring after you already have the Emeralds, you get 50 rings and can either immediately turn supersonic or sustain supersonic for an even longer period of time. Additionally, once you get to Mushroom Hill Zone, there are seven more emeralds to collect, so you're immediately back on the exploration track. My overall point is that there's always a reason to be on the hunt for shields, rings, and special stages. The special stages themselves are competent, though I'd struggle to call them absolutely amazing. They're more puzzle-based. Avoid the red spheres, turn the blue spheres into red spheres, surround blue spheres with red spheres to turn them all into rings, get all the blue spheres for an emerald, get 50 rings for a continue. Standard fare, and while these special stages certainly err on the side of caution, they aren't very... interesting. 
Sure, it's fun to figure out how they work the first time, but there's really not a whole lot of skill involved once you know what you're getting into. At least with Sonic 2, once you had the stages memorized, there was skill involved in getting Sonic where he needed to go and avoiding the bombs with well-placed jumps. But in CD, it was all skill. Jump into the UFOs, avoid the water, keep your time up, and the entire stage was always visible and easy to read, meaning there's basically no need for memorization. I'd argue the Sonic 3 special stages also don't require a whole lot of memorization, but a few of them can get pretty hectic when you don't know what you're doing. If you're in one for too long, Sonic will travel at an incredibly fast speed, so fast that if you don't know what your next move is in advance, you could easily careen straight into a red sphere. Thankfully, it's not nearly as bad as anything in the Sonic 1 or 2 special stages. I just hesitate to call them amazing, and I think I even prefer the Sonic CD special stages. Unfortunately, since Taxman and Stealth couldn't touch Sonic 3, the frame rate on the special stages is horrendous, and it can honestly screw a bit with some of your inputs. It might not be fair of me to compare the frame rate of baseline Sonic 3 to the improved versions of the other special stages. I'm confident that if the frame rate were fixed, there wouldn't really be any input issues, and I can say that because because Mania has them and they run beautifully. My other complaint is that they can run a little long, though since you have to do them 14 times theoretically it isn't a huge complaint. I do enjoy the more complex Blue Sphere puzzles, which have segments where you need to let Sonic move backwards, or segments where you need to jump over a red sphere into a yellow bumper sphere, and I do sometimes like the panic moments where you're going at max speed and don't know where the remaining Blue Spheres are. I think an arrow or some indication of where the remaining blue spheres are would be helpful in a pinch, especially because it's really hard to create a mental map of these special stages and track where you've been going, since the perspective is constantly changing and the color scheme is pretty samey. Overall though, they're competent, and it's still my favorite system due to just how easy they are to enter and how much it adds to exploration. My favorite new reward for completing every special stage is Hypersonic, who has what is essentially a dash in any direction and glows a variety of different colors with sparkles all around him and after images. This is the first and only time we ever see Hypersonic. There's an extra cool touch when collecting the Super Emeralds, where you're transported to the Hidden Palace. No, 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 not that Hidden Palace. Anyway, what you're essentially doing in the Hidden Palace is powering up your existing emeralds, and what's really cool is that this exact emerald room can be seen later on when you actually visit the Hidden Palace. It's right after the room where Sonic is prophesized to defeat Eggman in space with his hyperform, a subtle and effective form of world building for such a graphically and narratively limited title. Generally, Sonic 3 contextualizes Angel Island the best of any Sonic game to this point. Act 1 of Sandopolis transitions into Act 2 via a pyramid entrance. Act 1 of Angel Island starts off in a grassy beach, which is set to flame by Eggman's robot, and the transition from Act 1 to 2 comes with a slightly remixed music track, and without a black screen. The camera simply pans, and you continue the zone. Additionally, from zone to zone, there's always a transition. Marble Garden ends with a boss fight where Tails carries you in the air, so when you transition to Carnival Night, not only does the sky turn dark in Marble Garden itself, you enter Carnival Night as you're lowered to the ground by Tails. In the original, though most of them worked fine, with some suspension of disbelief required when going from Ice Cap to Launch Base, there was always one that bugged me. The transition from Carnival Night to Ice Cap. You use a cannon to fly all the way to the Frozen Alps, and there's no indication that Carnival Night ever changed the daytime, it's just immediately daytime in the Alps somewhere. Sonic 3 Complete fixes this transition by going with the prototype design where Flying Battery was placed after Carnival Night. I imagine it was changed because Flying Battery was either A. unfinished when they wanted to release Sonic 3, or B. was a bit too much of a spike in difficulty. I mean, Flying Battery kinda works no matter where it's placed, since the thing can theoretically show up whenever it wants and drop you wherever it wants. Going from Mushroom Hill to Flying Battery to Sandopolis makes perfect sense, and it's not so far-fetched to imagine going from the dried-out Mushroom Hill straight to Sandopolis, especially since the time of day is at least the same. Overall though, even when playing the original, these stage transitions really help to differentiate Sonic 3 from its predecessors. In a way, it focuses even more on the story elements than Sonic CD, with both the level transitions and the segments where Knuckles or one of Eggman's machines will fundamentally change the level's visual design. It's kind of like how time traveling worked in Sonic CD, but with more of a narrative purpose. The fact that Knuckles even has his own unique story to explain why you're going through the same zones as Sonic and Tails is genius, because it wouldn't make sense for him to play out the exact same story seeing as he was an enemy right up until the very end. 
Yeah, the Egg Robo isn't amazing or anything, but it still makes sense, even up to the finer details, like not letting him do Death Egg because it was destroyed by Sonic and Tails at that point, and just having his story end at Sky Sanctuary. For me, this is always what elevated Sonic 3 to new heights. When you're running around Mushroom Hill Zone, what are you thinking about? The speedy loops, the bouncy mushrooms, the secret areas, the chicken blowers, the gorgeous visual design, the amazing music? You might very well be thinking about that stuff. I know I am in the moment. Yet, I'm also thinking just as much about where this fits into Angel Island. Mushroom Hill happens at the mid-season finale, if you will, after you prevent the Death Egg from lifting off and chase Eggman down to finish the job. Going from launch base to Mushroom Hill has narrative purpose and also makes thematic sense. Obviously this stuff doesn't necessarily matter in the other games. I guess it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to go from grassy plains to a chemical plant to an old ruin to a casino, but it's not like it really made a difference in the long run. Its introduction in Sonic 3 is a pure improvement, icing on the cake if you will. It contributes to a larger narrative that lacks scope for sure, but threads each new zone together. The final few zones link into the final boss in a marvelous way. You find the hidden palace after exploring the lava-infested underbelly of Angel Island, and Hidden Palace has a transporter that takes you to Sky Sanctuary, a seemingly abandoned ruin floating in the sky. You travel here after Eggman steals the Master Emerald and actually succeeds in launching the Death Egg this time, so you use Sky Sanctuary as sort of a stepping stone to get into the Death Egg. It makes sense that Sky Sanctuary only has one act, and is by far the most linear platforming-focused stage in the game. There's no time to be wasted here, you need to stop Eggman. There are several boss fights because Eggman doesn't want you anywhere near his Death Egg for obvious reasons. He's throwing everything at you to prevent you from messing up his plans again, and once you finally get into the Death Egg, it's sufficiently challenging. It's slightly confusing to navigate with great attack telegraphs. It's challenging, without devolving into Metropolis, Scrap Rain, or Metallic Madness. It's not my favorite zone in the world, of course, I despise the light bridges, but I do think the gravity mechanic is unique, and to be honest, it made me a bit nauseous. In a good way. What I love about Death Egg is that the final boss takes place on the very top and doesn't take away your rings automatically like it does in Sonic 2. Now, if you die to the boss, it doesn't give you any rings to start off with, but I do like how lenient it is on your first go. To make it a little more forgiving, they could at least have given you a few rings in the beginning, but made it so that once you lost your rings, they would instantly fall thanks to gravity or something. As it stands, the rings you do lose don't bounce on the platforms below you, so you aren't necessarily allowed to cheese the boss thanks to the knockback frames that prevent you from immediately grabbing all of your rings again. Honestly, this is how every boss should handle the ring system, so that it prevents you from cheesing the boss without forcing you to brave the boss with zero rings. The actual boss, though... He's okay, I guess, but I honestly wonder why so many people complain about the Death Egg robot in Sonic 2, but not about the final boss of Sonic 3, which is just as difficult. You have the mini-boss that emulates Mecha Sonic, where you take out the mechanical fingers, and then you have to deal with the real final boss by jumping into the cockpit, damaging the Master Emerald, and avoiding the giant laser with a precise jump. This segment doesn't take as long as the Death Egg robot in Sonic 2, but you can just as easily die in one hit and get sent back to the fingers, which if anything, are a little bit more offensive than Mecha Sonic because they take just as long with absolutely zero effort. Seriously, you can spin dash in place and you'll get through the segment in no time flat, it's just a time sink. The final segment is what really irritates me. After you've finally got the timing down, you know the boss like the back of your hand, instead of winning outright, you need to chase Eggman down and hit him another eight times. Thanks to Sonic's unique physics system, if you hit Eggman fast enough from the very left of his cockpit, Sonic can fly all the way to the left where there aren't any platforms. Even worse is that as soon as you land the final hit, you can't even adjust the stage scrolling momentum to your advantage. Plainly put, if you're running too fast when you land the final hit, Sonic will die. To even survive this segment, you need to hit Eggman from the bottom, which is pretty easy when you know what to do, but that final middle finger is what always gets to me, and considering it sends you all the way back to the first segment, I'd say it causes more harm than good. Big Arm has this problem as well, requiring you to refight a pathetic first boss, jump into Eggman's Eggmobile, watch an epic cutscene where Eggman attempts to lift the Death Egg into space, fight the real boss of Launch Base, then fight the real, real boss of Launch Base, which is by far the hardest challenge you'll have come up against in the entire game. Granted, on your second or third go, Big Arm is very predictable and easy to down, it's just ludicrous to expect the player to sit through so much waiting around to get to the real final boss. Maybe there's a reason they took out Big Arm when you attach Sonic and Knuckles. It was meant to be a cap-off to Sonic the Hedgehog 3, but Sonic and Knuckles already has a send-off with the Death Egg boss fight and Hypersonic segment. The hypersonic final boss fight isn't all that revolutionary either, though I do like it for story reasons. It's an epic space battle where you can fly around as hypersonic for the first time. It also gives you more purpose to finding the emeralds than just watching a shiny new cutscene. 
Mechanically though, there's an unbearably long introduction segment where you collect rings so you don't lose all of them too fast, and when you actually catch up to Eggman, all you're doing is directing missiles into his cockpit. You're not going to take damage here, so there are almost no stakes. It's even more laughable afterwards, just ramming into him a few times until you're done. Again, I like this boss for more thematic reasons than I do for gameplay reasons, though the other bosses in the game aren't too shabby. First Eggman boss has bottomless pits and some well-timed fireballs for you to jump over. The second boss of Hydrocity has some interesting platforming to reach his tall cockpit by using the bomb momentum, and avoiding the torrential water can be a bit of a challenge. The second boss of the Death Egg is pretty interesting as well, forcing you to time when you change the gravity so the spike enemies will fall into the floating orb in the middle of the screen. Unfortunately, though it has some great bosses, most of them are still laughable. The first mini-boss isn't even worthy of being called a boss, the launch base Eggman encounter is a joke with the insta-shield, the Sandopolis mini-boss is literally just slowly waiting for him to jump into the quicksand, and while I like the second boss of Lava Reef and think it's really unique, it's a bit repetitive for my liking. After the third cycle of him eating up the lava, my mind starts to wander. I do appreciate the effort of giving unique tracks to the mini-bosses, major bosses, and final boss. In Sonic 3 Complete, you can even use the original mini-boss theme said to be composed by Michael Jackson. It's a little... Weird. I'd be lying if I said I didn't like it, though. The remix tracks for each act are pretty great as well, though in some cases like Ice Cap Act 2, it just feels like they stripped away a few of the instruments, and what we're left with is... kinda soulless and strange. Sonic 3 is the perfect template for a classic Sonic game. It has an outer shell that's absolutely solid. Multiple playable characters with different advantages, narrative elements that add context to the adventure, zone transitions that help build Angel Island as cohesive, and a general zone template that blends speed, platforming, and exploration very well, with two loose types of more focused linear stages and less focused non-linear stages. However, this only works as a template, as an outer crust. I flat out don't like Marble Garden or Sandopolis, Carnival Night isn't as interesting as Casino Night's pinball focus, most of the bosses suck, the special stages aren't perfect, and it lacks a lot of the fixes that the mobile ports made to the originals that fix them fundamentally. Lacking a consistent frame rate and widescreen is a huge detriment to the experience, since you don't have nearly as much time to react to stage hazards or obstacles. Add widescreen and you fix Marble Garden quite a bit, add a stable frame rate and you fix the special stages quite a bit. Sonic 3 Complete gives you an unparalleled set of options, and that's great, but it's still only the original, and that experience, along with all the other original versions of Classic Sonic, is flawed. Sonic 3 is my favorite original Classic Sonic game precisely because it's the most well-rounded, but I firmly believe that on some level, this game is a tad overrated. I don't like using that term because it puts people down that genuinely love the game, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to make it seem like having a high opinion of Sonic 3 is objectively wrong, because that's impossible. Hell, I have a high opinion of Sonic 3, I just don't see it in the same light as the rest of the community. This game is deified as the best and sometimes only great Sonic game, that it somehow did everything right. Whenever you bring up Sonic Adventure 2, for example, and complain about it, almost always the finger is pointed back to Sonic 3 as if it had no flaws at all. Clearly, as I've outlined, it's not perfect, and really, raising Sonic 3 as this impossibly high standard for the series may have hurt it and the community in the long run. People new to the game might play it and feel the hype blowback when it isn't as godly as it was made out to be, and I definitely felt that blowback a few years ago. Remember, I started Classic Sonic with a much more negative mindset, because I didn't give it the time or attention it deserved. After I gave each game a fair shot, multiple playthroughs and all, it finally clicked with me. I don't love them, but they're certainly speedy 2D platformers and I can't get that experience in many other places. I'd like to make a call to action. Lay off the 3D games. Look, some of them are terrible, you can go after Shadow or 06, and it's not like I'm gonna go after you for it. However, Sonic Adventure 2, for example, is my favorite Sonic game. Preferences exist, and I understand that, but the amount of people who vehemently go after the bad parts of SA2 really bother me, especially if they go on to praise Sonic 3 as if it's the gold standard. Sonic 3 is great, one of the better Sonic games for sure, but we seriously need to walk it down a peg. 
it gets really annoying to talk about Sonic and hear, if only we went back to the classics, there was never anything wrong with those. In fact, there is plenty wrong with classic Sonic. Bad visibility, poor frame rate, questionable level design, a piss poor selection of bosses. The great parts of classic Sonic shine through. Why can't the great parts of modern Sonic? Though, I guess I'll save those thoughts for my eventual discussion on 3D Sonic. I don't think I'll jump straight into Sonic Adventure, though. I've thought about this for quite a while, and I think I'll save a Sonic Mania analysis video for the future. I have a lot of other videos in the works, one of which may actually be on Sonic, funnily enough. For the foreseeable future, this ends my series retrospective on the mainline classic Sonic titles. I hope I was able to provide a fair and balanced critique of the formula, as well as a roadmap for the future. As you can imagine, I think Mania follows that roadmap more or less faithfully, and I'm excited for the future of 2D Sonic. I hope you enjoyed this series retrospective. It was very fun to make, I had a clear outline from the beginning as soon as I started Sonic Mania. I knew that I wanted to talk about these games. If you like the video and want to see more, consider supporting me on Patreon. Please don't donate unless you think you can. I'm not trying to take money from people who can't donate to me. I cannot thank all of my current patrons enough for their support. If you can't donate, that's fine. Please comment below, like the video, share it. Engage with the video in some way, I really like talking to you people. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video. Certainly, all of you should have some well-deserved fun today.